we always have plenty of action at the New Mexico Museum of Space Center. It is great to see you. Thank you all for coming. See a lot of folks that have been here before and some new folks. We appreciate uh, you coming and learning about our history. This is a, a great place to live in and be aware of what went on in the past. There will be a quiz today. A one question quiz. Right now. How many of you knew before you came here, saw the press release, uh, that there was a New Mexico Space Trail? New Mexico Space Trail. Just a few of you, which means, all right, we have some newbies in here today. I'll tell you who's known about the New Mexico's importance in space for decades, and that's science fiction writers. If you ever listen to old radio programs, X minus one was a science fiction program, Dimension X, they would take short stories and turn them into scripts for those programs. You can find them online. And guess what? A lot of rockets took off in those stories from White Saints. <laughs> and recently, I found this, this magazine online from 1947. I like to read those, they're, they're fun to see. And once I got it, I noticed, there's the Oregon Mountains. In the front. <laughs> and the teaser at the beginning says, today, the V2, tomorrow, the moon. <laughs> and the story is all aboard for the moon. So. Writers have known about New Mexico's importance to space for decades. And we're going to look at the New Mexico Space Trail today. There are more than 50 sites around the state. And you can find them at nmspacemuseum.org. That sounds like a commercial. nmspacemuseum.org. Uh, you will find the map on that page. And it will show you where the sites are. A lot of them are organized so that if you want to make day trips and visit numerous areas, you can do that. We'll look at some of those today. Some of them are inaccessible. Some of them are on Native American land. If you go to Las Cruces, for example, and you look off to the left, you're coming from Las Cruces, you will see an orange and white gantry out there. That is Launch Complex 33. That's a historic monument. That's where the first V2s were launched from and you'll see the uh, bunker out there as well. So as I said, more than 50 sites statewide make up the New Mexico Space Trail, and here's some background. This is a former curator right here. Some of you may have known George House. He passed away several years ago, our longest serving curator. And one day he was coming back from Las Cruces, and it struck him that he saw these sites right here. There's a historic marker for the San Augustine Pass, there's one for the Pat Garrett murder site. And in doing some research, he realized those are all over the state. And he thought, what a cool idea it would be to have markers such as that about New Mexico and where a lot of things in space took place. So he got back, he started researching, he compiled a lot of things. And that's when he found out something that all of us learn eventually. New Mexico has no money for things like that. <laughs> but he continued on with the progress, and in 2000, the New Mexico Space History uh, Museum, us, began to chronicle the space trail. Ten years later, Dennis Kintai, I believe he's mayor of Roswell, or was now, but he was in the legislature, and he introduced a house memorial that officially designated the New Mexico Space Trail. And it goes all the way back to archaeoastronomy sites. There are sites uh, in the Sacramento Mountains over near Ruidoso that were ancient observatories. How they knew how to build those things is still in question. Uh, Pete Eidenbach, who since passed away, who was an archaeologist, did a program on those. And Pete said that they were built so the sun would shine directly through them during the solstices. And that's how they knew when to plant and when to harvest. And if they didn't do that, and the snows and the winter came early, they wouldn't have food stores <coughs> that would last them through the winter. Of course, there's Chaco Canyon. A lot of astronomy took place there. There uh, is rock art depicting a nebula that was so bright in 1054 AD that you could see it for a month during the day. And that is uh, depicted on one of those rocks. Wally's Dome is in our area. 
you can go to the Three Rivers petroglyphs between Tularosa and Carrizozo and see some, uh, some representations of things in the sky as well. Well, the modern age of rocketry really began about 1930. And Harry Guggenheim, Robert Goddard, and Charles Lindbergh, and of course Robert Goddard is known as the father of liquid fuel rocketry. There were three folks in the world really experimenting with rocketry at that time, Goddard in the United States, Selyakovsky in Russia, and uh, Hermann Oberg, Professor Oberg in Austria, Germany. If you go through the museum and find his picture, he's a grumpy looking guy. He was actually born in Transylvania, which may explain that. <laughs> but Goddard really was the only one who was actually doing experimentation, and he was doing it in Massachusetts. And you can imagine in the 1920s, it's a society much unlike today. We didn't have loud cars and trucks and television. Radio was in its infancy, so people were used to the peace and quiet of the countryside. Well, along comes Robert Goddard in Massachusetts, and he starts blowing up rockets. And sometimes they hit buildings, and sometimes they caught on fire. So the fire marshal in Massachusetts went to him and said, you just cannot do that anymore in this state. Well, Charles Lindbergh, who we know made the first nonstop flight across the Atlantic Ocean from the United States to Paris, actually sought out Goddard because he wanted to know if rockets could be used on airplanes taking off of ships in the Navy. And eventually they would develop what's known as the JATO, the Jet Assisted Takeoff. But that was early in, in rocketry's infantry. And he took Goddard on his first plane ride to Washington, D.C to meet with the Guggenheims. Anybody seen the movie Men in Black? You know, at the beginning, Will Smith is chasing an alien around that silverish round building. That is the Guggenheim Museum. And they were uh, philanthropists. Goddard wasn't impressed with Lindbergh's fly because Lindbergh thought it would be fun to take him up and down and skip the treetops. It wasn't his uh, most enjoyable adventure. You'll read that in some books about him. But he introduced him to Guggenheim and convinced Guggenheim in 1929 to give Robert Goddard $100,000. That's millions in today's dollars. And so they began to look around. Where in the world could we go in the United States where the weather is good, people won't complain, uh, there's a lot of space, it'll be <coughs> noise, it'll be far away? New Mexico was at the top of that list. Roswell, New Mexico. So with $100,000 in his pocket, Roswell, New Mexico is where he came and finished out his career in doing rocketry. He died, I believe it was in August of 1945. That was just about exactly one month before the German scientists came over who were part of Operation Paperclip. They came over the first wave in September. And it's too bad they never got to meet. There's a belief by some that the Germans actually accessed more than 200 of Lindbergh's public patents and may have used some of his designs in the German rocketry. But unfortunately, I guess that's not provable. They never got to meet and discuss it. So that really begins, especially in the United States, the uh, modern age of rocketry. If you've ever been to the Roswell Museum and Arts Center, if you haven't, I highly encourage you to go. Goddard was a member of the Rotary Club in Roswell, and when he died in 1945, all of his fellow Rotarians got together, they took all of his equipment, and realized he's using 19th century tools to build 20th century technology. And they took it all, and they recreated his lab right here in the Roswell Museum and Art Center. So you can actually go through and see the tools that he used, he and his crew used. This one down here is a panoramic photo that I took that shows you the the good sized portion of the room and where all of those tools actually are. That's one of his rockets right there. They also have some Peter Hurd uh, art and some Wyatt art and some art I'll never understand, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's a fun museum to visit. Now it's right down the street from the Alien Museum and of course everybody goes to the Alien Museum in Roswell. Uh, Roswell's public relations officials really latched onto this many years ago. It's created a worldwide destination for folks. Was there really a UFO crash? Who knows? But if there was, it didn't crash in Roswell, it actually crashed near Corona. 
And if you've ever been through Corona, there's not a whole lot there. Uh, too bad they didn't latch onto that because it might be much larger than it is now. But uh, Roswell is, of course, on the New Mexico Space Trail as a place to visit. And as I mentioned earlier, you can do day trips. You can go to Roswell and see two museums. You can drive through Carrizozo and other places in the area if you want to kind of get an idea of what all is in that particular area. Then we get to Clyde Tomball. And Clyde Tomball had a huge impact. Uh, Tomball, and this is a great story to tell kids when they come through on tours, Tombaugh grew up in Kansas. If you've ever seen the movie Green Acres, or the TV show Green Acres, they were horrible farmers. Tombaugh's family were farmers, and they didn't do any better at it because they were trying to farm in Kansas during the Dust Bowl era. And so there was really no money to send Clyde to college. He really wanted to go to college, but there was no money whatsoever. What worked in his advantage was he had an uncle from Streeter, Illinois, who loved astronomy. His dad had an interest in astronomy. With no money, you can't buy telescopes. So they taught themselves how to build telescopes from used tractor parts and used car parts. At one point, Tombaugh got his hands on a round piece of glass from a ship's porthole and ground it into a mirror himself. So they did all of this. Now, his first one didn't work very well. He learned from that. He built a second telescope. It was better. What you see right here is his third telescope, his Newtonian telescope. And with that, when he was about 22 years old, he would go out at night, he would look at things in the heavens, and he would sketch what he saw. And having no education and wanting some professional criticism, he sent his sketches to the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. And just as an aside, that observatory was built by Percival Lowell, who in the late 1800s would look at Mars, see these lines, thought aliens were building canals, and wanted to research them more, so he uh, built the observatory in Flagstaff to do just that. Tom Ball sent his sketches, and it just so happened that they were looking to find somebody to hire to search for what they called at the time Planet X. And he had enough money to buy a seat for the three-day trip from Kansas to Flagstaff, Arizona. No money for uh, a sleeper car. No money for a place to live. So for the nine months they undertook the search, he actually lived in the observatory on top of that cold mountain. If you've ever been there, and I have, it's, a, it's a very pretty up there. But it does get cold in the winter. And the story is... One of his jobs was to stoke the fireplace at night to keep things warm, because that's when they did most of their, their viewing. The, one of the stories told is that they, they would actually take glass plates, take a picture of a small section of the night sky, and several days later they'd repeat that process, same area. they put it on this machine you see in the upper right-hand corner called a blink comparator, and it would blink those images back and forth. And if anything moved, that was a likely candidate for what might be the anomaly for which they're searching. And after three months, someone dropped one of the glass plates and broke it. And it wasn't until after they had discovered Pluto that they went back and looked at that plate and they realized they could have named it three months. So another about six months passed. He discovered it and said, uh, for 45 minutes, I was the only person in the world who knew there was another planet out there. It was so super secret that he was not even allowed to telephone his parents. They didn't find out about it until they opened up the newspaper one morning and read about the discovery. And then eventually, he would come to New Mexico. He, uh, he taught in Arizona naval candidates during World War II about how to do uh, navigation from the stars. He worked at White Sands. If you go out here and look at our Igor our, uh, in the dome out here, uh, that's something that he helped develop as kind of an automatic tracking camera when he worked at White Sands. And then he landed in Las Cruces, helped co-found the astronomy department there, was a Unitarian, and at the Unitarian Church, you'll see at the bottom right, there is a stained glass window that depicts his life and his career. 
So he was extremely instrumental in, in uh, space history in New Mexico. We had a registrar, some of you may remember Mike Smith, who in 1963 took, was in college working on his associate's degree and took, took uh, Tom Boss class. They became friends for the rest of their lives. That wasn't uncommon, Mike said, with students in Tom Boss classes. He formed associations and those lasted for uh, until Tombaugh passed away. Tombaugh was extremely inventive. You can find online, they had it for a while at a museum in Las Cruces. He got tired, I guess, of moving big telescopes around, so he mounted it permanently on a lawnmower and would just push it around, and that made it a lot easier for him. So as I mentioned, the first wave of V2 folks uh, German rocket engineers came in September of 1947, Operation Paperclip. You see the first wave here. Paperclip got its name because as we interviewed those engineers, we liked them, they put a paperclip on their application. And that's really how simple it was. They came in to, I believe it was uh, a port in New York. They were illegal aliens, basically. They came out here to White Sands they scoured the German countryside, and when they unloaded the hardware that they found in Germany, it took 300 railroad cars to bring it all the way to New Mexico. <laughs> so at one point, as the story goes, they took these initial Germans, and they snuck across the Rio Grande into Mexico. And then they came back across the bridge legally, so they could say they were now legally in the country. <laughs> uh, they worked in the area for a couple of years. Most of them went to Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. A few stayed behind, such as Dr. Ernst Steinhoff. He was chief rocket scientist for many years at, at the Holloman Air Force Base. He also taught at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The one story I am told by people who knew all of these German engineers who stayed in the area was you never wanted to get into a car with them because there was no such thing as a speed limit. <laughs> and, you know, they're shooting off rockets. What's 45 miles an hour in a car? <laughs> but they uh, eventually built those rockets to evolve into the Saturn V that boosted our Apollo astronauts out of the atmosphere. The F-1 engines, we have an F-1 out in our rocket park. It took five of those on the bottom of the, the uh, Saturn V, which I believe was like 63 stories tall. And those five rocket engines developed seven and a half million pounds of thrust. And those guys did all, <clears throat> did all of that. Uh, it, it's amazing technology. And it all started right here in New Mexico. So as I mentioned, there's the orange gantry. You can see uh, from the road <coughs> at uh, White Sands, there is the bunker adjacent to the gantry there. The first launch, it's new technology. If you've all gotten early cell phones, you know they don't always work like they're supposed to. And that's a good example of technology. The first V2 launch, you see a V2 in the bottom right taking off right there. The V2 lifted off. There were folks in the bunker, and those had about 10-foot <clears throat> concrete thickness ceilings and walls. They were built to withstand a direct hit from a V-2. We can imagine there's not a whole lot you can see out a window in a 10-foot thick wall. So they all decided, hey, let's go outside and watch them. <laughs> <laughs> and they're on their way out, and they look up, and it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It's actually looking like it's turning over and going to come right back at them. So they're rushing to get back inside. At the same time, people inside are still rushing to get out. <laughs> Fortunately, it did not hit them. And there was a guard station inside of the door for every subsequent launch. No one was allowed out until the all-clear signal was given. Two of those rockets crashed off base. A lot crashed on base, but two crashed off base. One right over in this field right over here. And... Uh, before the military got here, the good citizens of Alamogordo came running up to see what happened, and they took secret cameras and parts off the rockets. <laughs> and so there were like 4,000 people in Alamogordo, I think, at the time, and they went door to door and got all the rocket parts back. <laughs> the other one, a gyroscope issue caused a problem. It was supposed to go up and north. It went up and went south, went over the 
border to Mexico, hid outside of a cemetery in Juarez, made a 50-foot crater, and by the time our military got down there, they found a guy selling tickets to see the missile that America bombed Mexico with. <laughs> and I don't think they ever got all their rocket parts back. <laughs> Uh, you see an arrow bee here in the upper right. We have a couple of arrow bees here in the museum. Those were used initially to take uh, rodents, mice, and small monkeys, rhesus monkeys, into the upper atmosphere because we did not know how radiation would affect tissue. So we were using those type of creatures to see if uh, it would be detrimental to our human astronauts. And you see the little Joe too. We have one of those right outside here. Little Joe 2 was used to test Apollo escape systems. If the mission had to be aborted, the capsule would separate, a parachute would come out and bring the astronauts down safely. Worked perfectly every time they tested it, and uh, fortunately they never had to use it in real life. Now, I am told <clears throat> that the rocket, which was used at White Sands, Arrow Bs were done at Holloman, the V2, of course, at White Sands, that the Little Joe 2 always took off at an angle. If you've ever watched the early missions, Apollo, Gemini, and Mercury, they'll talk about going into the roll program when they get to a certain height. And if it took off, took off at an angle, they could simulate that earlier and not use as much fuel to get to that point. So it saved them uh, quite a bit of expense when they, were, when they were doing that. But if you've not seen our Little Joe 2, go out and take a look at it. Out at White Sands, the Delta Clipper, if you're watching those rockets today take off and where the engines come back and land perfectly on the launch pad, they were doing that with the DCX in 1994 at White Sands Missile Range. There it is right there. It flew about a dozen missions before it fell over on its uh, last landing and exploded. You can find great explosion video online. It actually exploded once in air and they were able to land it, not on the launch pad, but able to land it successfully. There was no one inside of it. It was, it was being run by this astronaut right over here. <laughs> you want to tell them who that is, Kathy? No, I want to see if they know. Oh, anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> Pete Conrad. So Conrad flew that at White Sands over several years, a dozen years. Now Conrad is another great story to tell kids. He actually got kicked out of school in the 11th grade. Uh, they basically told him he's stupid. His mother would not settle for that. She helped him design a system of learning, found him another school, graduated high school, not top of his class. He would do chores trying to earn money for folks in his neighborhood, and instead of taking the money, he would go do chores for pilots and say, take me flying. And he got a scholarship to Princeton University, graduated, not at the top of his class. The guy that they told was stupid and kicked out in the 11th grade flew the DCX and was the third man on the moon. Now, if you know the story of Apollo 11, you know that when, when the two astronauts, Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, got to the landing site, it was filled with boulders. And they couldn't land there. Armstrong took manual control, flew it off about a football field's distance away, landed it safely, and they had 16 seconds worth of fuel left. So they didn't get to go where they wanted to go, which is why when you hear the Capcom say you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue down here, they were holding their breath. They didn't know what was going to happen. So they decided on Apollo 12 to pick a specific point and prove that they could go where they wanted to go. And that was about a football field away from the Surveyor 3 spacecraft that you see there. And you see, if you look, the lunar module in the background, they landed there and they were able to walk to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. So Pete Conrad had a huge, huge impact in this area. 
Uh, unfortunately, when he was 69 years old, he was riding his motorcycle after doing all of that, riding up the California coast, had an accident, and they killed him. Now, a lot of space-themed films, I mentioned earlier about the stories and the radio programs that talk about White Sands, but if you've ever seen the movie Destination Moon, that actually used film from a, I believe it's a V2 bumper launch at White Sands. They actually use a bit of film from a radar disc and from the trail of an explosion in the sky. The last scene is the crash of the V2. It wasn't an actual crowd. It is the prettiest cheesy effects that Hollywood could come up with at that time. Uh, I have a clip that will show you that. There's an actual launch. You see the gantry over there to the right. And there it goes. <laughs> I want that car. <laughs> if you want to watch that movie, never seen it, it's on YouTube. <laughs> we all know about Trinity Site. In fact, the next tour is coming up the first April Fools, I believe, in April twice a year, in April and October. And that was July 16th of 1945 that helped test the device that ended World War II with the Japanese. And that, mon or that uh, monument right there is right at ground zero, and there's a little bit, if you've never been out there, the rebar from the tower left on the ground that held the bomb about 100 feet off the ground. It's an interesting place to visit. If you can, you should do it at least once in your life. In 1963, with all of that testing we had done at White Sands, the governor at the time, Jack Campbell, in June of 1963, wrote a letter to President John Kennedy proposing the idea of a spaceport at White Sands. They had done a lot of, of work at White Sands. That road, you take the Las Cruces, that road was not originally there. It was actually closer to some of the launch sites, and because it was... World War II in a secret project, they completely rerouted the road. So nobody would be able to see what was going on out there. But uh, Governor Campbell talks about our heritage, and he says, we in New Mexico believe the first inland aerospace port should be based here and earnestly solicit your acceptance of our views. Uh, unfortunately, just a few months later, President Kennedy was assassinated. And that really never went anywhere. The I've also read one reason it's in Florida because at the time they had better politicians who, <laughs> who could advocate for that. And also there was the issue of liability. What happens if, if you know, we were fortunate when the rocket just hit the hillside out there? What happens if it blows up and hits right in the middle of town? It could be a huge issue. So there were really several things that, that uh, led to that. Holloman Air Force Base, you could do an hour program at least on, on Holloman Air Force Base. All the missiles tested there. The base was developed and uh, started to be developed in 1941. The Germans wanted to come over here, or not the Germans, but the British wanted to come over here and, and do flights, pilot training. And they were in the process of doing that, and we were building them the runways. It's in a triangular configuration, which is what the British wanted. 
when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, World War II loomed really close on the horizon, really closely, and so the British decided to stay there. And with war looming on the horizon, we further developed it to train bomber crews. Unfortunately, they rushed so many crews through that there were massive accidents. A lot of people were killed in the initial flights out there. There was a, a young man who was training on a bomber crew that was in Alamogordo for a time. Here's a trivia question, might win you something on the radio one time who eventually grew up to be governor of Alabama, George Wallace. Spent some time in Alamogordo. Some of the highlights, which you are probably familiar with, Dr. John Staff, uh, the fastest man on earth. If you want to see something really neat, go to YouTube, type in John Staff Groucho Marx, you bet your life. Because a few months after he did his December 10th, 1954, run to 632 miles an hour at a dead stop in 6.4 seconds all of his blood vessels in his eyes burst and he was temporarily blind. He was a guest on, on You Bet Your Life with Groucho Marx. And I think he was 38, 39 years old, not yet married. And it's just fun to watch the interplay between the two of them. Michael, he was also on Earning Comebacks in sort of like You Got a Secret. Oh, was he? Oh, wow. So this picture right down here on the bottom right is not Dr. Stab. But it's a movie that was shot at Holloman Air Force Base in 1956 called On the Threshold of Space about the work that Dr. John Stapp was doing at Holloman. John Hodiak is playing Stapp. The man in the fedora is Dean Jagger, who is the general in White Christmas. He played in an episode of The Twilight Zone, a senior citizen, had an old radio long for his youth, was in an episode of The Partridge Family later in his life. But uh, they filmed that out at Holloman Air Force Base. I've never seen it. I know we have uh, an actual, I think, 16 millimeter version of it in our archives. But at some point, I would, I would uh, really like to see it. Time Magazine called him the fastest man of Earth, developed this artwork over here on the bottom left. And maybe the country and the world didn't know what we're, we were doing out here up to that point. But after that, yes, they did, of all the testing that was going on out here at the base. And of course, you can't talk about Dr. Stapp without talking about Joe Kittinger, who died in January, toward the end of January, I believe it was. He was the first pilot in Man High, and he did the three jumps over the Tularosa Basin as part of Project Excelsior to test parachutes. His uh, first jump <clears throat> had a problem with it. He was in an open gondola, and to give him a little bit of heat, they would put water bottles underneath the seat. In the freezing process, they give off some heat. I guess some heat is better than no heat. And he was massively dressed up anyway. And the seat looked rather ratty, and one of the officials out of the base told a carpenter, rebuild that seat because we're going to take a lot of pictures and it looks like crap. So the carpenter rebuilt it, but he didn't rebuild it exactly like it was before. When they put the water bottles under there, they couldn't get them out. As they froze, they formed frost on the seat. And that, he's got a 150 pound data pack on his hind end right there. That stuck to the seat. And he couldn't get loose. It took him 16 seconds to wriggle loose. By that time, his automatic parachute timer had gone off. And so when he jumped, it came off early, he went into a flat spin, 120 revolutions a minute. Of course, the blood's going to leave your brain. He passed out, and at about 10,000 feet, fortunately, a second parachute came out, and he was able to, to land safely. Second flight, textbook perfect, to around 75, 76,000 feet. Third one, his right glove failed to pressurize. He did not report it. He knew that if he did, they'd abort the mission. That took place right out here. And we were borrowing money, or the military was, from the Wings and Balloon Company, not the government, the Wings and Balloon Company. They were using the last of their money for this flight, and if he'd aborted the mission, there would have been no more. So he got to 102,800 feet, said a prayer, jumped, and began to free fall. 
something like 10 to 13 minutes. He says initially he didn't feel that he was moving because he was afraid that that cord there did not disconnect. And he says it wasn't until he turned over and looked and saw the capsule just disappearing into the upper atmosphere as he fell that he was falling at a tremendous rate of speed. Uh, he was able to get his parachute open, landed safely, but was not able to cut off his data pack because his right hand, when the glove failed to pressurize, had swelled to twice its size. He suffered some frostbite. And so he landed weighing more than 300 pounds and walked away. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are a lot of more, uh, exploits in his future, but that was his uh, main mission here at Holloman Air Force Base. And there's the, the chimpanzees that we trained. We trained chimpanzees. There were some scientists at Holloman who thought that once a sentient being got into space, the heart wouldn't work in weightlessness. The brain wouldn't get blood. You'll die. So they trained these, these chimpanzees to do tasks. You see HAM here on the bottom left at the back. That's an acronym for Holloman Aeromedical, where he was trained. His initial name was Chang, but it was the Cold War, the Communist Chinese, or our enemies, and our government didn't think something that sounded vaguely communist would be accepted by the American public. So they changed it to HAM. There's Enos up front there. HAM had a problem on his mission. His fuel burned itself up five seconds early. That doesn't sound like a big problem. But his computer said, uh-oh, and hit the abort and shot him up from 114 to 150 some miles, which put another two hours for them to retrieve him, endured a tremendous amount of Gs. <coughs> and Dr. Ron Brown declared that we were not going to send a human astronaut up until we found the problem. Alan Shepard was supposed to lift off right after this launch. Shepard said, I'll take the risk. I'll go. I'll do it. And the NASA hierarchy said, when it comes to rockets, burner is key. His word rules. So in the three months it took to find the problem and get Shepard up into space, that's when the Soviets set up Yuri Gagarin. That's why they got the first man in space. And they actually taught Ham to drive a pickup truck, too. Uh, we had Milton Windler here several years back. He worked for NASA. He gave a presentation, and someone who'd worked with the chimpanzees at the base stood up and said, we taught them how to smoke cigarettes, too. <laughs> <laughs> they would come up and go, when they wanted a cigarette. <laughs> Can we take pictures? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Or, yeah, go ahead. or if you want, copy of the pictures, let me know afterwards. I can get you copies. Uh, some stuff that we did. We did a lot of work with the Soviet Union. Stuff takes place at the NASA White Sands test facility. I say some stuff. They tested the Apollo engines. That's at Oregon, NASA Johnson facility when you go to Las Cruces. The Orion Project crew escape vehicle was tested there. This is the coolest thing, I think, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in this area. That is the actual lunar module that was used to test the ascent and descent engines out at the NASA facility, and it's sitting out in a corner of the warehouse there. Oh, wow. And occasionally they put it on a trailer and bring it to public events. But that's the actual unit right there. And that all took place over near Las Cruces in New Mexico. Other stuff in our area, White Sands Space Harbor, high energy laser test facility, very large array. Here, let's see, uh, I believe it was Sunday or Monday, Jack Lausma celebrated his 87th birthday. He was one of the astronauts that STS-3 that landed out of White Sands Space Harbor. Very large array. Sadly, most people only know that from the movie Contact. But the work they do there is just absolutely incredible. This ought to look familiar, Lou. <laughs> uh, Apache Point. They, in about 1995, started to photograph the entire known universe. And you can find a lot of photo photographs online from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You're looking at the first coronagraph at Sacramento Peak, Sunspot. That picture's from 1947. They didn't even have a building up then. And their first telescope, correct me if I'm wrong, but their first telescope was known as the Grain Bin Dome <laughs> Telescope. It's still up there. 
they bought a grain bin from the catalog at Sears Roebuck, and some folks at Holloman came up and put it together for them. You can go up there and walk around on a clear day, you see all the way to Mexico, see the Franklin Mountains, the entire White Sands, the Tudorosa Basin. It's an absolutely incredible view. During the Apollo era, astronauts came to New Mexico to study geology. Sometimes they went to Arizona, but that's Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> they came to New Mexico, and we're proud of that. And these are amazing photographs. The, the young boy in the bottom right there came out to Philmont Scout Ranch at Cimarron. To, and one of the things he did while staying there was study geology. That's that boy right there. Many years later, he would come back. He's in the cap there looking at the clipboard before he went to the moon and became the first man to step on the moon. So those pictures of the young boy are Neil Armstrong as a Boy Scout wow. from Wapakoneta, Ohio. <coughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, Billy, you still up there? Isn't he wearing, the guy on the left, isn't he wearing his cowboy hat backward? Yeah, he's got it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> but the man who taught them was Harrison Schmidt, who was born in Silver City, and he would eventually go to the moon on Apollo 17. All the rest were pilots. He's the only scientist ever to walk on the moon. We have a moon rock in the museum that he brought back. This is Spaceport America. I took that photograph several years ago. That's Buzz Aldrin giving a talk out at Spaceport. And we're seeing more and more things happen at Spaceport America. Some of the other folks who were important to New Mexico space history, that's Gene Kranz from NASA. If you see the movie Apollo 13. Uh, he, we took that photograph here several years ago. He came to the museum. Little known story is he was a fighter pilot, lived in Alamogordo. One of the things he wanted to see when he came here, he and his wife wanted to go back to see the house in which they lived. If it had been me, I'd have knocked on the door and seen the reaction of the folks inside. <laughs> but he was a fighter pilot. They put him on desk duty. He didn't like that. And one day reading a magazine, he saw a little ad that said, new agency, we're hiring. And he put it in an application because he was upset. That was NASA, and that's how he got his job at NASA. G. Harry Stein in the bottom left G. Harry Stein was here at the museum during its construction. Basically, the initial curator kind of helped in the direction process. He was an engineer at White Sands. He wrote science fiction under the name Lee Corey. And he developed the National Association of Rocketry Safety Code. He saw in this new age of rocketry in the 1950s, kids building rockets, and they were blowing up and they were killing kids and maiming them. People were losing fingers and hands. So he developed that code, and every time you buy a model rocket, there will be instructions in there that reference the NAR safety code. He's passed away, but his legacy lives on. And then this gentleman in the bottom right is Paul Haney. I would imagine some of you in here knew Paul Haney. Uh, he joined NASA soon after its inception. And he's the guy that developed the protocols on how to interact with the press. He eventually retired in Alamogordo. He owned a cherry orchard, orchard in High Rolls for a while. You could go pick cherries and interact with his ostriches. And then when his health got bad, he came down here and he lived uh, over off of First Street. He had all kinds of stories to tell, including he left NASA. He was working with a British television service when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. And after the successful mission, he said, I was in the control room. There was a knock on the door. Some folks came in to introduce me to a VIP, and it was the queen. Oh. Unfortunately, we all told him, write your history down. He was good at writing other people's history, at writing introductions to books. He never recorded his own history. And when he passed away, huge loss. Didn't even do, I don't think, an oral history with us. Huge loss to the puzzle of history. All right, the last thing we're going to look at are New Mexico astronauts. We have five living in New Mexico now. Three of them are from New Mexico. This here is Ed Mitchell. 
He's originally, I have spent a night in Hereford, Texas. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a there. Uh, Johnny's been through Hereford. Is that possible? Uh, is that possible? Uh, if you've ever driven by a, a cattle facility and rushed to get out of the area, yeah, that's, that's Hereford, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he's from Hereford, Texas. <laughs> But he's a graduate of high school in Artesia, New Mexico. And when he was a young boy, he would watch the crop dusters. He's 10, 11, 12 years old, decided that's what I want to do. And he went out and started flying planes, illegally. He was not old enough to fly planes, but he went and did it anyway. And eventually got his doctorate and walked uh, on the moon on Apollo 14. Toward the end of his life, if you listen to the late night radio conspiracy shows or watch the documentaries, you'll see him talking about aliens. I had an incredible mind found in what's known as the uh, Society of Noetics, I think, in California, which looks at paranormal type of things. But yes, he's a graduate of high school in Artesia. Mike Mullane. Mike Mullane is from Wichita Falls, Texas. And he came here several years ago. He wrote the book, Riding Rockets. He will tell you, don't let your kids read that book. <laughs> he tells it like it is, but he went to West Point. He was what's known as a WIZO, a weapon system officer in the back of fighter planes. And he wanted to be an astronaut, so he applied. They told him, your eyesight's not good enough. You have to be a pilot. He will tell in his talks that even though he got the no answer, he went back and he did his job the best that he could do it. And eventually, NASA created other positions. And he reapplied and he was accepted and he flew on STS-41D. He was on the maiden flight of Discovery. He was on 27 and 36, which were both DOD missions, not a lot known about those. But he still lives in New Mexico, I think in the Albuquerque area. You see him down here in the white room and at his West Point graduation and in his seat as a wizard. These three astronauts are from New Mexico originally. Drew Gaffney is from Carlsbad. And he flew on STS-40. He got his medical degree and he was on a mission that looked at uh, space lab life sciences. That's all he did on that particular mission. He's a cardiologist so they did a lot of it of a test in that area. And Sid Gutierrez, who flew on STS-40 and STS-59. Sid came to visit us a few years ago. And he had, his, I think, his young granddaughter with him. This is a great story. So I got tasked with taking him on a tour of the museum. And we get to, at the time, we had a display on him up on, I think, what's now the third floor. And he showed his granddaughter's picture and talking about what he did. And there's probably a dozen other people in the room and they were doing their thing and talking. And all of a sudden I noticed it got really quiet as they realized who was standing there in front of his display explaining to his uh, granddaughter what he had done in space. And they were very respectful of him and he went over and talked to them. So Occasionally, we do get some, some VIP visitors here. And then I mentioned Dr. Harrison Schmidt on Apollo 17, the next to last man to walk on the moon. You see them on the rover. That's the rock that he brought back. We now have his watch that's up next to the rock on display that he wore in Apollo uh, uh, 17. And you can see it, I believe, on his left arm right there over his suit. He's wearing that watch. He is from Silver City, New Mexico, served a term in the legislature in Washington, D.C., ran for re-election, and was defeated by Senator Jim Bing at that time. So those are the five astronauts who currently live in New Mexico. And when he came to visit us some years back, I took that photograph looking at the rock that he brought back. The man who was just staring in awe at that rock is Bill Kraft. Bill Kraft, many years ago, went on a campaign to get a Star Trek stamp. And it took, I think, what, several years to actually get the post office to take them seriously. 
and he wrote a book about it called Maybe We Need a Letter from God. <laughs> People wrote letters, but you know, God didn't write one, and he got so frustrated he thought maybe if God wrote one, we'd get that stamp. Eventually he was very successful. Uh, as I said, 50 sites around the state. You can find the map on nmspacemuseum.org. And if you have an interest, go visit some of those spots. Most of them are open to the public. Some of them are on Native American and, and private land. Some of them are advertised. Uh, some years back, the ones on Native American land were vandalized and damaged, so they just they don't give directions out to those anymore. So now you all know about the New Mexico Space Trail. And we encourage you to go out and gossip and tell other people. Any questions? Yes? Yes. Do you know when uh, Apache Point might next be open for visits? They've been closed since the pandemic. Yes. Uh, there, I haven't seen any announcements that said they're actually open. They're, they're, they're operating, but it's not open to the public. You can walk around on the grounds, but you can't go in. But I think we, we've taken kids up there, but if you call them, I mean, are you affiliated with a group, Boy Scouts, kids group, something like that? Uh, I'm affiliated with this museum. Um, Sometimes you can arrange tours with groups that they will let you in. We're able to get our camp kids in from time to time out to Launch Complex 33 at White Sands because of that. So they get to go out and see the bunker and the nearby Gemini tracking mission station as well. But yeah, at the moment, they're, <clears throat> I don't think they have any plans to do that whatsoever, unfortunately. Yes? Uh, is there anywhere in town where any of the German people, the scientists, that we could know where they lived at? Were they here or were they on the base? There, I've never seen any publication that says where they lived in town. I think they lived off base. Uh, when they were working at White Sands, they were they were living in an old hospital at Fort Bliss, and they would bust them in every day. Uh, their families were kept in Germany for up to two years, in part to make sure they fulfilled their contract. They were taken care of and fed, but when they did the work at White Sands, they lived at at uh, Fort Bliss in El Paso. I know Ernst Steinhoff's son, so you know I could ask him. Uh, there were six Steinhoffs, only one was born in the United States. Uh, they survived the bombing, the Royal Air Force bombing of Pina Moon Day. They were living in a basement apartment, and when the complex fell, that was the only reason they survived. One of them was born here, the youngest, Reiner Steinhoff. If you play soccer or know about the soccer, field on First Street, the Reiner Steinhoff Soccer Complex. He was a teacher at Outland Memorial High School, died in the late 90s. But I'll have to ask Hans where they might have lived. He lives up in Cloudcroft right now. So I still need to get your information from pictures. Yeah. yeah yes, uh, I was interested. You mentioned the, the fact that somebody that was quite important um, may have written down other people's uh, histories and that sort of thing, but not their own. And I had a suggestion I mentioned earlier uh, to someone, but um, we have an awful lot of people that attend these that have worked within the space program and all these other things. And that's one of the fascinating things about coming to this is to be exposed to people, their history, right? I mean, part of the history. And um, I think it'd be worthwhile to have the people uh, of those of that era or whatever, uh, write down their name and so on, so they could be contacted if they're interested in being interviewed, so that you have, you know, a, a vocal and visual record of of what they did, yeah. where they worked, that sort of thing. Because I mean, I came here, I just sat here, and I, my gosh, I'm, I'm sitting in history right here. They're talking about gyroscopes no bigger than your thumbnail. <laughs> And, and, you know, that were occurring at times that I was growing up and, and you know, I never was even aware of something like that. And, and, um, and so uh, another thing is you were talking about uh, the Germans that came over. Um, my aunt grew up in Roswell, New Mexico. And um, so she told us some stories about the German POWs that were there mm -hmm. and uh, that there's either an arroyo or something else like that that they lined with stone as part of their project 
and they have something in it, whether it says um, uh, their name or whatever the thing is in stone in, in, uh, over in, in Roswell. And she said that the um, space alien thing was for real, and she grew up there, so I, you know. Witnesses always make it more credible. <laughs> yeah, she said that people who were associated with it somehow, you know, all of a sudden they were reassigned someplace else, and, uh -huh. and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, yeah, so we've got the history right here in our audience. There were German POWs outside of Cloudcroft, too. Uh-huh. And the ranchers would go check them out for a day to help use them on the ranches. They were treated very well. Oh yeah, I mean, they, they, yeah, it was a better situation for many and, of them. And Paul Haney was the gentleman you were referencing. Uh-huh. Uh, about a month before he died, I had lunch with Paul over at the Golden Corral when it was there. Uh, and I had a yellow notepad with me, and he, before we got food, he talked for an hour, and I'm sitting there scribbling notes. And he told some amazing things of being in Florida during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis that I'd never heard, never read in a textbook, never taught in college. He said there were fighter jets, they closed down all of the highways in southern Florida. And there were fighter jets sitting there with their engines running, ready to take off in case Cuba launched missiles. Yeah, my uncle was in the Air Force at that time in Florida and he said that was the closest we came to, to another yeah. world war. So Kathy's got a piece of paper over there. <laughs> so I do. <laughs> uh, there were a couple other questions over here, I think. Did I see another hand? No, good question. Yes. If you have military access, can you go through that bunker? Or do you have to, or you find the road like everybody else? Uh, military access? Yeah, like everybody else. 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 Yeah, like Get a, uh, what is that guy's name? He's the curator. George worked there for him for a while. Uh, well, I think actually you would need to arrange it through uh, public, affairs, public affairs for Darren Court. Darren he Court, is yes. The, uh, uh, curator, but the museum is still closed at White Sands as they renovate it. And it is going to be stunning when they're done. Just saying. Okay, Same pictures, they look great. <laughs> when they opened up the museum in 90, the one that was there, it was 90. I think I'd have to look at the year. One of the guests was uh, Clyde Tombaugh. Shortly before he died, he was there in a wheelchair, and a lot of folks were talking to him. You'll let us know when it'll. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as I know, I'll put it on our Facebook. Yeah, follow our Facebook page and nmspacemuseum.org. <laughs> Good pitch. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Johnny. Uh, I don't know if. You anybody's seen this, but I had little kids, and there's a movie called Space Camp. Yes. That was made yeah. years and years about these kids who get accidentally launched in, uh, on a shuttle. Yeah. And they actually land in White Sands. Oh. And it's been years since I've seen it. Yeah, it, they made the big reference because they're trying to get their way down, and they don't know the calculations, and they finally are able to communicate. And they figure out. It, yeah, it was, it was just a, it was this Dumb fun movie for especially if you have grandkids, <laughs> they'll they'll love it. You never know; it might excite them, it might yes. motivate them. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you coming. I'm sure there are still a few donuts and coffee left. And Kathy's got some announcements.